Hi, everyone. Uh, we have a great webinar for you to discuss the electrical measurement safety, a topic that should not be taken for granted. My name is George Rivera. I'm an engineer and sales manager at T Equipment. And joining me is Kurt Keating. He's a senior sales manager or engineer with uh, Fluke Corporation. Uh, thanks, Kurt, for, for being with us. Appreciate you having me. And uh, he actually drove out to our facility, so we'll be doing it from, from our offices here at T Equipment. Uh, and please stay tuned to the end of the webinar. We'll be posting a coupon code for a free PRV240 proving unit. It's a voltage source to verify uh, electrical um, test tool is operating correctly. The first 25 customers in the U.S. that use the coupon code and check out will get it free, including free shipping in the continental U.S. So stick around to the end of the webinar. Uh, before turning over the presentation, well, um, I just wanted to go over a couple slides uh, while we're waiting for any late joiners, a little bit about our company. So our, our company is over uh, 17 years old, and we've become a very large stocking distributor. Uh, we really do take to heart the slogan, buy from people, not just the Internet, and have a qualified staff here to help you. As you can see from this slide, as a national and international distributor, we cover the needs of a wide variety of customer types on the left. And uh, the right side gives you some of the product and instrument types that we carry. Uh, it totals more than a half a million products. And on this slide, uh, you can see our, our company has in, invested heavily in making the website a great resource on the left side you can see uh, a lot of uh, filtering capability on uh, some of our listing pages. And here's just one example. And then on the right side, there's uh, an internal order portal that we use to help customers over the phone and, uh, and keep track of things like uh, uh, problems that don't, won't fall through the cracks because it has a uh, calendar reminder feature so we don't uh, forget to take care of a customer's request. So, uh, let me turn it over to Kurt. Again, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, one second while we uh, post the, uh, get the slide uh, show for him. All right, there we go, Kurt. All right, you're on, Kurt. Hey, good thank afternoon, you. everyone. Appreciate you uh, calling in on this. Um, my name is uh, Kurt Keating. I'm with Fluke Corporation. I'm a senior sales engineer for Fluke in the northeast uh, yeah, portion of the United States. Uh, appreciate your time to listen in. Uh, we as a company are celebrating 71 years now in the industry, based out of uh, <clears throat> Everett, Washington, north of Seattle. And uh, we're very concerned with uh, the uh, safety issues around taking live measurements on uh, industrial or commercial circuits. So we're going to go through a slide deck to uh, cover most of these. At the end of that, uh, if you folks have any questions, feel free to type them in. We'd be more than happy to uh, answer those. Um, and uh, again, George uh, made a comment that they have an offer to you folks uh, for participating. Uh, that is a Fluke product that's uh, quite useful to uh, determine whether or not my meter is working correctly or not. So with that in mind, we're going to uh, jump to the next slide. So, if I was doing this uh, seminar live at a customer's, uh, the question I uh, ask them uh, immediately is, how many folks have ever got shocked by anything other than your paycheck? And uh, we get a variety of answers on this. So, uh, how much current does it take to shock me and or electrocute me? So, let's hit the uh, down arrow there, George. You don't have to play a clip. Just, no, just, just hit enter. There, all right, there you go. There go. So, this is, a, this is a question that we get a lot of different answers for, as you can see. So we're going to kind of go through this. This is a, it's a good understanding you should have if you're working an electrical circuit and you're working with a high, high, high amount of current, you should be well aware of how much current it takes to, uh, to shock me. So starting at 1 milliamp, uh, you get a slight tingling sensation. So again, this would be a reason why you wouldn't want to wear gloves and have insulated tools. Well, let's say you weren't and you decided to go in barehanded. Uh, at 5 milliamps, I'm going to get a slight shock. Now, right at that point in time, just for point of reference, 
any form of a GFCI will trip between three and five milliamps. So that's why it trips that low, so we don't get shocked, basically. Um, somewhere between six and 16 milliamps, you'll have a painful shock. And if I was holding on two parts of an electrical circuit, the muscles in my hands would actually contract and I could not let go. And typically we see that happens somewhere around 10 milliamps. If it increases upwards beyond 10 milliamps, uh, upwards of uh, 75 to 99 milliamps, somewhere in that range, uh, extreme pain, but you also have respiratory failure where you cannot breathe, you cannot yell out for help, and of course, you can't let go. Any higher currents above that, anything from 100 up to 2,000 milliamps or 2 amps, for five seconds across my chest cavity will pretty much stop your heart. So traditionally, we're talking, uh, for the most part, for an average size human being, uh, a quarter of an amp, 250 milliamps, for five seconds across my chest is enough to stop my heart and kill me. So that's uh, not a lot of current, and it is all about the current. So irregardless of what the voltage is, the current is really what will kill you. So with that in mind, we obviously all need to give electricity a lot more respect than it's due. And shock can happen in a variety of ways, as we'll see through the next slide. So one can get shocked not only through the skin and the muscles, but also your hair. And shock can cause electrocution and death, obviously. So the other issue starts to get into what we call arc flash. So arc flash is where you have a phase-to-phase -phase or phase-to-ground fault or short circuit. This can actually happen with test leads, as illustrated on the picture here. And what that basically means is, if my test leads got too close, I could actually have an arcing effect where the two arcs could join and cause uh, a, what's called an arc blast. So the duration of time for an arc flash typically is about one second. And human nature is, a flash happens and we pull back, which is actually good. But if we would continue there for a moment longer, and keep those two test leads close to each other, what can happen is what's called an arc blast. And an arc blast is obviously a catastrophic event where you're exploding an electrical circuit and we're taking basically solids or metal and we're gonna turn it into vapor. So a variety of things are gonna happen there as you can see, pretty intense heat. Normally it's in the form of a fireball. I've got acoustic shock wave, I've got molten metal, I've got blinding light, I got toxic smoke. And then we have obviously the opportunity to become involved with an energized circuit. So for most folks, this is a big deal. If I'm using a piece of test equipment, how long are my test leads? Traditionally, four feet. How big is my arc flash zone where I have to be concerned about this? Typically five feet or greater. So if I'm in making a measure with a clamp meter or a moldy meter, I'm gonna be that close enough to the panel where that arc blast can basically hit me right in the chest or right in the face. So that could be obviously catastrophic and or deadly. So we're obviously all trying to avoid having an arc blast. So what causes an arc blast or an arc flash? So here's a couple of examples. So there's high speed noise that can travel in an electrical circuit. This is something that's totally oblivious to you and invisible to your meter in many respects, but it, uh, the meter is being hit with what we call high voltage transients or spikes. And they could be upwards of six to 8,000 volts. And as is a function of these different types of loads in the top left corner, they're switching on and off or something as basic as a lightning strike. So these will cause damage, and these spikes can trigger and join two phases together. So that's how we get the arc blast and or a flash. Go on. What are the other reasons why we have an arc flash and arc blast? I'll go through them very quickly here. Racking a circuit breaker in and out. So this is more of an industrial circuit breaker, where it actually is on a, on, on a skid, or it's rolling in and out, and we're racking it in and out. And obviously, something falls across that as we're moving it in or out and causes either two phases or phase to ground to short together. Loose panel wiring and removing panel covers are a big issue. For a lot of folks, uh, things are falling and or things are touching other things. And uh, again, two phases or phase to ground causes things to happen. Using a hand tool across two phases. Uh, I see a lot of people using a screwdriver handle and or the shaft of a screwdriver in a variety of ways you really shouldn't be doing. And again, this is where you wanna be using insulated tools. Incorrect test probes, uh, test probes that basically were not the design for the application uh, and or they're too long and so they can get involved with the circuit and cause an arc blast if you uh, actually put the two of them together across a phase. And then the misuse of test equipment, which is uh, a lot of what we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, so can I kill myself using a piece of test equipment on a circuit? Yeah, if you do it the wrong way, there's a high probability you can do that. Uh, we at Fluke are trying everything we can not to have that happen so that the meter takes the hit and you as an end user walk away. So the industry guidelines that most folks are trying to follow, and I'm assuming most of the people on the uh, line right now are trying to adhere to them, is what's called NFPA 70E. What that is is a set of standard workplace safety practices that are put through pretty much by the insurance industry to try to get customers to work in a safe manner around electrical circuits. And so there's a variety of rules and regulations around this, and you can find them in the NFPA 70E guideline. Uh, and these get updated about every two years. We at Fluke are part of NFPA 70E. We're actually on the standards committee. We're in the committee to help uh, set up the standards and the regulations around NFPA 70E for obvious reasons. We don't want our customers getting hurt. So part of this is safe work distances. How far away do I have to be before we have to put PPE gear on? And how far away should I be in, in dressing and using my piece of test equipment in the circuit? And what are the right ways to do this? So as you can see, there's what's called an arc flash boundary. There's a limited approach boundary. There's a limited space boundary. And there's restricted space boundary. And many of the uh, manufacturers now are highly suggesting to get your panels rated and to get the arc flash boundary set up that's got the appropriate calorie rated uh, PPE gear and the right tools you should be using for the job when you go into these types of circuits. So we don't sell any of that, but suffice it to say, you should uh, address NFPA 70 to figure out what those are for yourself and uh, do adhere to those because uh, those are important. So PPE gear is obviously required every time I go into an electrical circuit. There's some level of PPE gear, but minimally, we're going to wear cotton clothing, we're going to have insulated tools, we're going to have insulated gloves, and we're going to have some kind of eye protection and or face protection and probably hearing protection as well. So there's a quick guideline, but again, consult NFPA 70E for what's specific for your particular locations. So last but not least, this is where we would get involved. NFPA 70E now has test equipment as being part of my PPE. My meter's first job is to protect me. No big surprise for anybody who's been using a meter for a long period of time, what's the first thing that hits the circuit? It's the ends of my test leads, right? Not my, not my screwdriver, not my gloves, it's my meter's leads, and the end of the leads are actively in the circuit first. So with that in mind, there's a lot of guidelines that have been put forth, and again, we've been very influential in the marketplace trying to get these done correctly. So the first part is having the meter rated for the equipment in the circuits where they're gonna be used. And we'll get into that in quite a bit here in a minute. And the environment where I'm going to be used. Is it inside, is it outside? And I need to do a visual inspection. We need to make sure all parts of this meter are working and the display is working and obviously the battery is good and it turns on and all those basic things. And that goes without saying. But in addition to that, the last one is the important part. We need to do insulation of protective tools, including voltage test indicators shall be verified by test and inspection. So this is where we're actually going to test it up against the known live circuit before we go into the target circuit to ensure that the target circuit or whatever you're going to work on is in fact de-energized or dead. So these are the standards in the marketplace that we adhere to and, uh, and all test equipment users should be adhering to these as well to make sure you're in compliance. So here's what the categories look like. So there's one additional one that's not being shown here and it's called CAT1. Uh, but we'll talk about the three that are. So CAT4 is at the utility connection and typically anything outdoor. So if I'm going to use my piece of equipment, whether it's a multimeter, clamp on, what have you outside, it should have a CAT4 rating on it. CAT3 is at my distribution panel. And traditionally, this is where most electricians work. They work on the secondary side of the transformer. And for most of us in the United States, that's going to be 480 volts or 277 or 240 or 208 or 120 volts. And that's considered the CAT3 environment. So from a voltage perspective, we're talking 208 volts to 480 volts is traditionally a CAT3 environment. And that's where most meter users are using test equipment from folks like Fluke. Single phase would be my receptacle outlets, which is CAT2. So that's my 120 volt loads. And then CAT1, which again is not shown, is my 24 volt DC power supply loads. So the meter has to be rated for where you're going to be using it. So this is the environmental piece right here. Where am I going to physically be with the meter and make sure I've got the appropriate category rating based on that? Next is making sure that we meet the standards. 
So the test equipment industry has adopted a set of standards called IEC 61010. And again, this is a part of the standard of NFPA 70E to make sure that the meters are properly rated for the environment where you're going to be using them. And what this inquires is two things. The voltage rating that you're going to use it to, in other words, the maximum voltage you're going to use it to, and then the category of the environment where I'm going to use it at. So the combination of the two are what's marked now on a meter. So for example, a CAT 3000 volt or CAT 3 600 volt rating meter is now going to be stamped on the meter. And we want to make sure that we understand what all this means. We're going to talk about that. But suffice it to say, all test equipment, all test equipment has to have these rating on it, even the little voltage pens. So everything you carry now needs to have a CAT rating on it so that you can be in compliance with NFPA 70E. So where we look for those ratings are going to be right between the volt and the common of the meter. And we at Fluke have been doing this now for quite a few years, so all of our meters are rated this way. And as you can see, in some instances, there's going to be a dual rating for an indoor and an outdoor application, which is great because now I can use that meter inside and I can use that meter outside. And some of them are singularly rated, like our 117. It's just CAT 3, 600 volts. It's basically for an indoor application only. So pay attention to where you're going to use it and how the meter is rated. And then the last part of this is, keep in mind, I think I started this off saying we were making meters for the last 71 years. So what happened prior to 1997? Well, that's when the, all this started. And so prior to that, all the way down to 1948, when we started the company, none of the meters had a rating on them. Those meters are not to be used anymore, plain and simple. They don't have a rating, they don't have the protections, and you're not in compliance with NFPA 70E. So in effect, stop using them. Uh, that's a safety reason, not the fact that it doesn't work anymore. A lot of them still do. We see a lot of older meters in the market that still work, but they're not in compliance with NFPA 70E. So you're basically out of compliance with the standard that everybody in the industry is trying to adhere to here in the United States. So we also take several other steps at Fluke. We send them off to a third party testing lab to get everything UL tested and rated. We do sell product all over the world. So not only UL, CSA in Canada and TUV in Europe are the agencies. And you might have multiple agencies listed on the back of a Fluke meter. Why? We sell that same product all over the world. And so we have to have it uh, certified by every agency, regardless of what country it's going to ship to. So look for that. That means the meter's been tested independently. And then, of course, read the manual. Now, we have a running joke at Fluke that 80% of the customers don't read a manual. So that's why guys like me have jobs. So we appreciate you guys not reading the manual. Thank you very much for that. But in all seriousness, please do read the manual. Uh, this is important information. If you've thrown the manual out with the box, which we find a, a lot of customers do, don't be, uh, don't be uh, shocked by this. Uh, go on to the Fluke website and type in the fact that you have a Fluke 87-5 millimeter. And uh, under the resources tab on the main uh, page next to that product, you'll have the ability to download the manual or read it online, whatever be the case. But that, uh, that information is there. So feel free to go look for it if you're missing that. So this is a popular product we sell a lot of. So little voltage pens have been out for quite a while. Um, this is a quick and easy way to verify the presence of voltage. It is, however, not a replacement for a direct voltage measurement as we have illustrated in the blue at the bottom, which says, use only a digital multimeter or contact the voltage tester to test for the absence of voltage. Why are we saying this? Well, in effect, these little testers, although they're convenient, sometimes can't really discern between which is the energized circuit and which is the de-energized circuit because of the proximity of wires next to each other. So in effect, what we're saying is, use it for quick reference, but if you really want to ensure that the circuit is in fact dead, you want to take a direct voltage reading with voltage leads coming out of your clamp meter or your multimeter directly into the circuit itself to actually verify that the circuit is dead. This is the highly recommended way to do it. Please do it that way. Don't use a voltage pen to determine that for yourself. We don't want you to be surprised. Methodology looks like this. This is the way you're supposed to do it. So we want to find a known good circuit. So let's say I'm going to a distribution panel or breaker box. And I've got an outlet nearby. So I would take my meter, and obviously after I've put on my proper PPE, we would measure between the neutral and the common, uh, excuse me, neutral and the hot of an outlet, and go verify it's 120 volts, or whatever it happens to be. And then we're going to go up to the live circuit with the tester and verify that the circuit is in fact turned off by seeing zero voltage. And then come back to the reference circuit one more time. What does this verify? It basically says this meter is fully working and that circuit is in fact dead. So... Uh, this is this is the proper way to do this. 
Uh, what we're highly discouraging customers from is just blindly going into the circuit and then assuming that the meter is working. It may not be. And you don't want to be surprised to find out what looks like a dead circuit is in fact live. This is how people get into trouble. So that's a standard methodology. And hopefully you guys will appreciate the fact that this is the way you should be doing it. All right. So this is the part of the presentation which you can be pretty excited because the little tester uh, that's sitting next to that other box, that's a fluke voltmeter and what he's got his test leads on is what's called a PRV240. And I think, George, how many of these are we giving away? We're giving away 25. We're giving away that's 25. Just wait till the end. And these are worth uh, upwards of somewhere around $150. So it's a, it's a nice freebie. Uh, what does this do? This is my known live circuit. This is a little device, believe it or not, that we developed that runs off of four AA batteries that with a little flip switch on the side can produce 240 volts AC or DC by just taking the tips of the test leads and pressing down in those two points, like you see illustrated there, and having the meter actually light up 240 volts AC or DC. What a beautiful thing. We have the ability now to test voltage where I don't have a secondary circuit. So let's say you're standing outside or you're on the roof and I don't have an outlet there. And I want to verify my meter's working first. That's where this comes in and becomes a very handy device. And as you can see, typical of Fluke, we've got your uh, Velcro strap and you've got your rare earth magnet hanging on it so it can hang up. So it does come with that. Nice little device. We sell a lot of these. And particularly folks who work in field service work outside, this becomes a very convenient way to verify the fact that my meter is in fact working. So, moving on. Test leads. Test leads are kind of the weak link. We see a lot of people do things with test leads including a wrapping around the meter. Not a good idea, folks. If you wrap them around the meter continually, you're really stretching and stressing those leads, and eventually they're going to break. So, or we're going to snap off. Right? Or snap up. So what we're doing now is we're putting wear indication on the lead wires. And the newest set we're uh, now selling is called a TL-175. TL TL-175s have two layers of insulation. There's a black layer on the outside and a white layer underneath, and then the wire. So customers always ask us, when should I replace my test leads? And we now say, when you see white. That's when you replace your test leads. We are shipping these leads with most of our new meters now. So the old leads are gone, and this is now what we're shipping. But if you're going to replace your old test leads with new ones, consider buying these. And here's why. Because these have an interesting way of being used. So the test lead tip has a little twist to it, and I can retract uh, or, or push out the extension of the insulator over the tip all the way to almost the end to eliminate the possibility of having two test leads touch each other on a live circuit causing an arc flash or possibly an arc blast. This is a great safety capability that we have. So as you can see, there's two different lengths. It's the same test lead. All I'm doing is twisting it, and that shield is either extending out over the end of the lead or coming back. So nice product. We're selling a lot of these, and again, this is the standard thing that we're now shipping with a lot of the uh, fluke meters. So the bottom line on this, what are we talking about? We're talking about the idea of working on de-energized circuits, if you can, lock out, tag out, all right, well-maintained test equipment, everything's approved, proper cat ratings, but of course, all the safety gear. Don't forget to put on the glasses, don't put, forget to use insulated tools and gloves, and obviously, don't forget to put all the insulated tools, okay, and insulating mats. Don't work alone if you can, right? Or let somebody know where you're working at. So if uh, you don't come back, uh, somebody will need to uh, think about coming to look for you. And then practice safe techniques. We always connect the ground lead at first and the hot second, and then disconnect the hot lead and the ground at second. We're going to do live to dead live, right? We want to go to a known circuit or PRV240. We're going to go measure the target circuit, see that it's dead, and then retest to a known circuit. What does this verify, folks? That circuit's dead. This meter's working. Those are the two things we need to know. We don't want to guess at this. We really don't. So all the protections built in. We spend a lot of time and effort putting a lot of front end protection into a meter. The idea is if I make a mistake with a meter, the meter takes the hit and I walk away. That's what we're trying to do at Fluke. Now, we can't protect people from doing very serious mistakes and the wrong things. We'll talk about what those are but a lot of basic things at Fluke are covered. 
So for example, if I were to take my multimeter and put it on ohms on a 480 volt circuit, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. That's a good thing for those folks who grew up using analog meters, like uh, I won't mention brand names, but analog meters. Uh, I could make some pretty serious mistakes, and uh, I worked for the distributor many years ago where we had a lot of them show up in our repair shop all blown up in pieces uh, because the guy hooked it up the wrong way. So we're putting a lot of front-end protection to protect you, the end user, so you don't become an accident. So what are the common errors? Here's two of the most typical ones. So for those who have ever hooked up a multimeter, which uh, many of them have four input jacks, not just two, like a clamp meter, but four. So what would they be if you're looking at the top left uh, disc, uh, meter shown there? The one all the way to the right would be your voltage. The next one would be your uh, common. The next one would be a milliamp jack. And the last one to the left is a current jack. So if I'm going to do voltage and current, uh, excuse me, voltage and resistance measurement, I'm pretty much operating between the volt and the common all the time. So what kind of measurements? AC measurements, DC measurements, millivolt measurements, resistance, continuity measurements, diode measurements, capacitor measurements. All those would be done off the voltage in the uh, common side. But if I'm going to do an inline current measurement where I'm going to break the circuit by myself in series, for example, like a 4 to 20 milliamp measurement, that red lead needs to move out of the red jack and into a milliamp jack or an amp jack. So I'm now running current series through the meter. On the bottom one, I'm uh, hooking up uh, uh, for a resistance measurement, I should say the one to the right, on ohms, and I'm measuring across the resistor. Let's say it's a fuse, but what happens if I have that meter lead on the first one flipped voltage, and I hook these two test leads uh, through the circuit? What are we going to do, folks? We're going to cause a dead short through the meter. So this is going to be a problem particularly if uh, you're not properly set up to uh, be able to handle this. And the way we're going to want to handle this is make sure that that fuse that's either on the milliamp jack or the amp jack is handle, able to handle that short circuit fault. So if we do that on an outlet, that could be 10 or 15 amps or 20. And if we do this on the mains of a building, that could be several hundred amps flowing into the palm of your hand. And that could be a real problem. On the, uh, the bottom one, if we're in ohms or continuity on a live circuit and the meter's not designed to handle that full voltage, again, let's say that's 480 volts, uh, that meter could potentially blow up on you. So that's a problem. So in most instances, we have solutions of fluke. So these are some actual pictures of what people have done. Why are we showing you this? This is not made up. We see this all the time. These are pictures of products that came into our service lab at fluke. And uh, for those who are old enough to remember, automotive fuses used to be uh, round glass style. Uh, I'm showing my age by telling you that. Now they're plastic tab style, but they used to be round. They used to be in the glove box. So why would somebody put an automotive fuse into a meter? Because it fit. That's why. Because it fit. But when called on to be a fuse, it's designed for DC voltage, and the fuse was supposed to be AC voltage, and the meter blew apart. This gentleman decided to put a fuse in there that was designed for, actually should have been a 600 volt fuse. He put a 250 volt fuse and didn't open up in time and blew the whole meter apart. Here's the worst part. He was not wearing gloves. How do we know? His fingertips are burned down into the plastic probes. He got severe burns on his hands and his arms. This is clear evidence that he was not operating in a safe manner. Not only did he uh, misapply the meter, not only did he put the wrong fuse in, he was not wearing any form of PPE gear. It was pretty obvious, or at least not gloves anyway. And as a result of that, he got burned badly. So getting burned is uh, typical of a uh, misapplication of a piece of test equipment. Because again, what's coming at me, it's a bit of a fireball that's coming at me when I make these mistakes. And so I'm going to be within four feet. That's the length of the test leads where this fireball is coming out of the circuit. And it's obviously going to hit my body. So how do we protect people from this? High energy fuses. These are rated to uh, 10,000 amps of fault current. They're designed to open up in microseconds worth of time. If I misapply the meter and I hook it as a series connection and then flip the, uh, the uh, dial connection to voltage, I'm doing uh, basically a phase-to-phase -phase voltage measurement, but I'm creating a dead shirt, short excuse me, through the meter, and that fuse had better be there to basically disrupt that arc blast. It's going to happen in the palm of your hand, and that's why we put high-energy fuses in them. And we do charge a bit of money for them, but they're rated and tested, and uh, it's designed to be able to take that kind of a blast. 
So the common misapplications kind of look like this. We talked about a few. Measuring voltage while test leads in the current jack. Again, causing a short circuit. We're putting high energy fuses to fix that. Uh, DC uh, AC or DC power while in ohms. Uh, we have continuous overload protection on every range of the meter. Uh, to protect that all the way up to the full rating of the meter, which in most instances is going to be at least 600 volts, and in many meters now is 1,000 volts. Beyond that, if you're deciding to hook to the primary side of the transformer and looking at a medium voltage circuit, uh, well, suffice it to say, you shouldn't be there. How's that? Shouldn't be there. Meter's not designed for it. You shouldn't be there. There's test equipment designed for that purpose, but it's not going to be a fluke meter. We are 1,000 volts and below. So be careful where you hook up to and make sure you're on the low voltage side of the circuit at all times. We can hook up a clamp meter to a multimeter to turn it into a clamp meter, a couple different styles. Consult the, uh, the flute catalog or go look at the uh, device online uh, like a multimeter and look at the accessories page and you'll see what kind of accessories like AC or DC current clamps could be used with your meter and which ones are compatible. For those folks who are doing 4 to 20 milliamp measurements, what we call process loop or loop calibration applications, Again, if I had to break the, uh, the uh, loop and wire my meter in the middle, that means I had to shut the loop down first off, and then I connect up my meter, and then I turn it back on, and we make our measurement, and then we shut it back down, and we unwire ourselves. Obviously, this is going to be time-consuming. Can we measure 4 to 20? Can we simulate? Can we source? Yeah, we have uh, different process meters that will do that, 787, 789, and a variety of loop calibrators. But if you're trying to get to a quick measurement of this, and you don't want to have to break a loop, we came out with our called process clamp meters. These came out quite a few years ago, and there's three models, 771, 772, and 773. These products have the unique ability to take that little tiny clamp at the top, split the wires apart, and clamp on one or uh, the other type of uh, the connector, and actually measure current all the way down to 10 microamps with the clamp on. Nice convenience, but the beauty of this is I didn't have to shut the loop down, and I don't have to worry about some kind of wiring mistake with my multimeter afterwards. So quick and easy, and uh, you can get in and out and uh, do it a lot safer. So misuse of uh, multimeter in an ammeter mode, we kind of talked about that. But you can check your fuse, and this is how you check your fuse. So obviously, we can check our fuses, we can check our leads, we can check our meter. We want to make sure all these things are working, right, gang? So how do I check my fuse? You can actually take either a test lead or a jumper lead and go from the common to the amp jack or the common to the milliamp jack, and while you're in ohms, I can actually see the resistance of that fuse. Nice, right? Then I know the fuse is there. If I have no resistance or it shows open, then the fuse is blown, and we know it's blown, and we didn't have to take the whole meter apart. So that's your quick, easy step for testing that if you're interested. And uh, we can do this on any type of meter. If I've got a fuse, uh, excuse me, a meter tip or lead. I take the tip of the lead and I go down into the jack directly. And you might want to turn it to the side just a little bit uh, so we actually hit the middle connection, metal connections and actually be able to see that resistance. But you do want to test your, your test leads as well. So we went through this, but we want to make sure that you're testing your test leads. I'm going to jump across these in a little bit and make sure that uh, your test leads are good on ohms as well. So again, safe working distances. Make sure we're... Uh, we're using the, uh, the right PPE gear. And then the last discussion we'd love to have with you folks online is the fact that we as a company are going wireless. What's wireless get me? Wireless gets me out of the panel. Wireless gets me out of the PPE gear. Wireless gets me on the other side of the panel door. So we started doing this a couple of years ago. As you can see, these are meters where the display pulled off. So we make it a multimeter, we make it a clamp meter. And what happens is the meter that's left in the circuit, the door closes, and then you stand on the other side, and I can see the display. But we, we decided there's a better way. So one of the things we came up with Fluke is uh, what's called Fluke Connect. This is a wireless uh, a app that we came up with. It's uh, Google Play, it's App Sites, it's iPhone, it's Droid Phone, it's uh, iPad, where we can go talk to the meter through the panel door wirelessly and paperlessly and grab my data. What does that do for me? Well, number one, that gets me out of the arc flash zone. Number two, I can actually do it from the other side of the panel door and heck, you're using your phone for 20 other reasons anyway. Why not have it talk to your meter? You're doing it. You're using it for everything but that. So we thought, let's add that to the meter function. So the meter is now either Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. And as you can see by the illustration, how about the idea that we can put the meter in the panel and we can talk to it wirelessly. So we can either have meters that talk to meters 
or phones that talk to meters, or iPads that talk to meters. But the whole idea of all this is to get you out of the arc flash zone and get you out of the PPE gear, which I'll be honest, I've talked to a lot of customers. Really, nobody wants to be there. So let's get you out of that uh, unsafe location and get you in a safe location is the idea behind all this. So we do this with power analyzers. We're doing this with thermal imagers. We're doing this for a variety of tools. And all this does two things. Allows you to be more efficient in your job and actually document what you're doing. And again, get you in a safe distance where you can be out of the arc flash zone and in PPE gear. So a couple examples, meters, clamp meters, power analyzers, all can be used this way. Thought I'd throw that out to you, some ideas. So it's called Fluke Connect. Check it out online. We've got some examples of this. If you're interested, uh, download the app off of Google Play or the, uh, your, your phone store. And uh, there's a tutorial on the app. We'll show you how this all works. It works really well. And we have a lot of customers using Fluke Connect enabled meters now. And we put FC for Fluke Connect on the label of the meter to tell you that it's Fluke Connect enabled. And a little Bluetooth button that you'd hit to turn on so that they can talk to your phone. So I can look at a lot of different devices. I can look at 10 different meters at the same time. Typically, we're talking about about a 60 to 65 foot radius. And I can document the measurements I'm taking. So the whole idea of measuring in the first place, we always ask customers, why are you there? And if you're not writing the reading down, you're not documenting, why are you there? <laughs> you should be, right? Uh, if you're taking uh, the time and effort to open up a panel and put all the PPE gear and go in there and make a measurement, you should be doing something with that measurement. That's at least the philosophy that we're following. And if I want to create a database and do uh, some form of predictive maintenance, I need to be able to trend those measurements over time. So that's kind of what Fluke Connect enables us to do, as you can see on a variety of topics. Thermal imaging is the other way to do this. Thermal imaging is also another way to profile what's going on. And yes, thermal imagers are wireless. And yes, I do have to open the panel door. Now, what's the problem? I have to put on PPE, and don't I? So there's a couple of ways of going around this. But one of the ways that we can go see all these invisible problems uh, thermally, uh, obviously, is also the ability of putting what's called an IR window, or infrared window, as it's called, on the panel door. And we'd mount that permanently. It takes about five minutes. And then I can shoot through the panel, and I can see infrared energy flowing through that crystal-based window, along with visible light with my thermal imager on the other side of the panel. Nice, right? Now we're going to save some real time. Because now I don't have to put the PPE gear and open up the panel door, and there might be two of me, and lots of time wasted doing all that. And in less than a few minutes, I can be in that panel, and I can be measuring things, and I can do it at a safe location. So very interested in talking with you folks. I know George would be and the folks at the equipment. If you're using a thermal imager and like the idea of IR windows, give them a call. I'd love to have a discussion with you about uh, how that all works and how that could be a benefit for you. So suffice it to say, just to wrap this up, NFPA 70 says that you got to be trained to use your test equipment. You should understand the ratings. You should do your visual inspection. You should operationally know it works. That's where the PV2R4 comes in. And try to avoid the misapplications, right? Everybody needs to go home. So be safe. Take your time. This is a thinking person's tool. We don't want to make mistakes. To uh, do a scorecard, if you wanted to check your individual meter, we've created such a thing. And uh, George, I don't know, are we putting this presentation up online? Yes, we are. We are. Okay, so everyone will get copies with by email as well. Okay, so you can go back and use this quick check to see does my meter pass or fail any of these points to make sure that it is working and properly rated so that we can uh, use it. That's what we hit. We hit it in rapid order. I apologize for that, but we're at 2:39, so. 39 minutes after the hour since we started. Hopefully, we gave you folks some good ideas. Hopefully, some uh, insight into uh, making measurements safely and the proper way. Um, I guess we're waiting for any questions, yep. comments. Yes? So, Glenn, uh, Glenn has a question. Uh, do, do all the new compliant meters that have the yellow, uh, have the yellow housing? Because you had that picture. Yes. The gray one. Yes. Yeah. Do all the well, um, well, yeah. We trade changed trade dress a while ago. We were kind of a oh, an olive green, I might say. So chances are that if it's a fluke meter or it's got a yellow housing, yes. But do us a favor, take a look between the bold and the common, and make sure that you've got that uh, category rating. Again, minimally should be Cat 3 600 volt, and that reading will be stamped into uh, the display 
right over the volt and the common on the face of your multimeter or your clamp meter. When, uh, when we started the webinar, I, the first few slides, uh, I forgot to show my screen, so I'll just show them real quick here uh, for, uh, for everybody. And um, so this is the, the slide that I mentioned that has a little bit about our company and our little uh, buy from people, not just the internet, which we actually trademark. Uh, this is a little screenshot from the uh, website and our internal portal. And then finally, the one that everyone's been waiting for, <laughs> the coupon code. So the first 25 people that go to T-Equipment's website and uh, find the PRV240, it was a very original coupon code. Yep. That's the part, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the part number. So you just uh, find the part number, add it to the cart, and in the checkout process, enter the coupon code PRV240. If uh, you're one of the first uh, 25, um, you'll get it free and with free shipping in the continental US, uh, Hawaii or somewhere else like that, uh, you might have a little bit of a small shipping charge. Right. But yeah, definitely uh, take advantage of that. It's a free tool, it might help you prevent an accident. So uh, one other uh, question. Kurt, um, so you had in the slides uh, about the uh, test lead that retract. What, mm -hmm. What's the part number for those? Uh, that's a TL-170 fly, fluke, fluke TL-175. Okay. And uh, you can buy that as an accessory piece, and I'm pretty sure that uh, T-Equipment has yeah, those sitting on the shelf. The, yeah, you could find those. Uh, and then you, you talked about third-party testing. So the question from uh, Pete is, why does Fluke have their meters tested by a third-party testing company? So we do this so that we know we are uh, in full compliance with the standard uh, because we believe that the meter safety rating has to be verified by the integrity of a third-party company. So we're spending a lot of money uh, with the ULs and the CSAs of the world to ensure that uh, not only the design of the meter passes all of our inspections, but in passes inspections from folks like UL. All right. Any other questions, guys? Let's see. Um, let's see what we got here. Uh, asking again about the presentation. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. The if on this page that I just put up, you see at the bottom there is that web link. That's a page. Uh, we I treat it like a part number on our website, IWH course. And all our presentations are there, the YouTube, and then in the Documents tab are all the uh, uh, slide decks. Uh, but for anyone that's registered today, you'll get it as an email as well. Um, and Okay, next question. Uh, why does uh, Fluke uh, add the wireless uh, connectivity to their products for the last few years? Uh, I think you kind of answered that. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're very concerned about customers working in our class zone and on energetic circuits. And uh, we're able to get the uh, electrician's time reduced to a potential dangerous situation, get them quickly onto the other side of a panel door. But we're still able to communicate with the fluke meter to take the readings. So the important part is I can still document what I'm doing, even though the meter's on the other side. And I'm now standing on the other side of the panel door with, uh, without having to have all that PPE gear on. Uh, just my own question. Would you say we're, we're almost at... Almost every product now has it, or because it it took it was phased in over yep. time, right? It's been a five-year course we've been on, but we're still not done. Uh, we're about 80 devices today, but we're working on more. So expect more from Fluke. Uh, I do anticipate probably the majority of the line will be wireless here within the next few years. And what can I do with the wireless measurement once it's stored on my mobile device? So that's a good question. So the ability to be able to document. So it's a time and date stamped measurement now. I can go take pictures of the panel to determine where I was, or the uh, let's say the the, uh, the nameplate on the motor, and identify. I can add a voice and a text annotation, and I can share that data with the coworkers and actually email that measurement off to them in real time, so they can now see what I see. All right, we're running out of time. Uh, want to thank everyone for attending. Appreciate your patience. Uh, hopefully you are one of the 25 that can get the uh, free uh, go of the free PRV 240. And uh, like I said, you'll be getting an email from us uh, maybe by tomorrow with the uh, slot, uh, presentation as a YouTube video. And uh, you certainly you can check that web link that I gave on the last page here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
we have any idea how many people are still left on the line.